originally from Kentucky, now reside in Daytona Beach, Florida, or the area of Daytona Beach, Florida. If I told you where I really live, some of y'all would say, where's that? But it's called the land, Florida. Uh, Stetson University's there. I teach at a high school. Um, it's my real job. My other job is uh, running around on a soccer field, raising a flag every once in a while. But I appreciate it. I've spent many days and many months here in the state of Iowa. Between 91 and 92, I think it was. Every summer I was in Ames, Iowa at, Ohio, at uh, Iowa State. Excuse me, I didn't mean to say that other one. Um, at ODP camp. So this morning we're going to just talk about some takeaways from youth events, from national events, from everything that grades eight, sevens, and sixes that we've seen this year needs to be addressed and talked about. I talk, but I also want you all to talk and I want you all to get me engaged because I do better the more you all engage me. It'll be better for all of us. I appreciate it. Just throw your hand up. You don't even have to throw your hand up. You can just ask the question. A lot of times I'll stop and do it in the middle because that's the way my students are as well. Um, so this morning we're going to talk about takeaways to get you to the next level. Youth advancement. What are your goals? I say, what are your goals? You don't need to tell me. Some of you all are more than happy to do youth, 8s, 10s, 12s. Some of you all want to go a little bit higher. Some of you all... Okay, are here for the money. We're all we're, we're all on the same goal there. All right. But what I want you to do is before this weekend's over is write a goal for yourself. Because when I started out in 1985, I put a goal. My goal was to put on the FIFA badge. At that time, the FIFA badge was only one. Okay. When I say only one, you didn't you didn't specialize as an assistant referee or a referee. It was just one batch. Okay? So it wasn't until years later that they started the specialty. They realized that they needed to start doing that. So set your goal. And during that, set little smaller goals to get there. Where do you want to take your career? For some of you young kids, you're like, my career, what do I want? Some of you all that are in your, your 20s and 30s, now you need to start setting your career. As a young man that I speak with monthly in Rhode Island, he's now trying to juggle his job and refereeing and life, as he said to me the other day. He goes, I don't know how you do it. I said, you just keep juggling the balls. All right, you gotta, gotta know how to do those things. And your career, whether it's your livelihood is a profession, doctor, lawyer, school teacher, accountant, or a college student. You gotta know how to juggle those things and make sure it all works out. And through my career, I've done a pretty good job with it. I've changed jobs so I can continue refereeing at the highest level. I'm an athletic trainer by trade. Anybody knows anything that, about those guys, if you work in a college or a professional level, you don't have a lot of free time. So that's why I went to a high school. I still do all of that work. I've got a great administration that allows me to leave and go and do all of these different things because they look at it as, oh, he comes back and talks to our students about it. That was one of my things is, is the agreement that I've always made is, is when you come back one day a week we sit down and we talk about what all went on in Honduras or Beijing, China or Spain. And so I'm giving them real life experiences. So where do you want to take your career? You're in control of your career. Nobody else is. And are you satisfied with it? If you're not satisfied with it, there's really only one person that can control that. All right? Yeah, there's a lot of, we'll call it politics, that go on. But if you do what you need to do, you'll get there. I had a guy that was our godfather in Region 2 when I was coming up, and he took a bunch of us into a room one night. We were at a big time tournament and he said you all worried about doing your job on the field 
let me take care of everything else off the field. If you do a great job on the field, I can take care of everything else. But when you start messing up on the field, it's hard for me to push you when they say, well, look, he just missed that dog so. He just missed that handball. He just had that mass confrontation. And he's the reason why. So you have to be satisfied with what you're doing. If you're not, change it. You've got to approach this game with bravery. And you say, why bravery? Well, for those of y'all that have been in some of those situations and some of those games, if this shows fear, your face and your body language, the players are like piranhas. They'll grab it, they'll chew it up, and they'll spit you out. And at the end of 80 minutes or at the end of 90 minutes or at the end of 70 minutes, you're going, holy crap. Okay? So I tell my students, I tell my soccer players, you can be weak, be weak inside or be afraid inside, but don't show it on the outside. There's a difference in that as well, meaning arrogance versus confidence. Okay? As young kids, y'all might not know what that word, those two words mean, but you'll learn throughout your career. You that are a little bit older understand. All right? A lot of your highest level referees, they show confidence when you see them. But their inside is going 150 miles an hour and spinning around and spinning around and spinning around. So, but they show the bravery. All right? And that's what we have to look at and worry about. Getting out of the way for him. Yeah, we're getting it done here. Y'all might know some of these people. I know them all pretty well. Joe Fletcher from Canada, Mark Geiger, see how he's talking to the guys? Ten years ago, he wasn't that confident with it, but he's learned, all right? He's learned how to adapt. So are these one of your goals from the youth soccer side? To be at the youth national championship? To do the ODP? To do the developmental academy? To do the Iowa high school finals? Okay, work the President's Cup? Or is this one of your goals? To work the NCAAs. Set your goals. Set small goals to get to the next level. You'll probably know that guy. Jim Elman. Okay. Or is this your goal? And what I'll tell you. And those of you all that know Terry Vaughn will tell you the same thing. You don't step on the people moving to that level to get to that level. It's all a group, and everybody's going to help each other out. So please don't step on somebody else so you can get there. So what's, what do we need for youth soccer? Youth soccer is a different animal. When I say an animal, I'm saying it's a different group. We, each, each week, week in and week out, you're going to get something different. So you need to be physically and mentally prepared. Mental stuff about situations just like in this room that have happened or that you think might happen and asking somebody their opinion on how to handle that situation. The physical preparation is all about you. OK? 
Okay? It's all about how you physically prepare yourself and you know going in that a U19 match, you don't need to be physically as a U12 match, right? So you need to think about that. One of the biggest issues that we've seen at the youth level, at every level, even at the professional level, is taking care of the mechanical issues. Signaling. We get them like this, like this, like this, like this. Okay? In the back of the book or anywhere, internet's great. It'll show you the proper mechanics of signaling for a throw in, signaling for offside, signaling for an indirect free kick, a direct free kick, play on. So when you take care of the mechanical issues, it's sort of like this. It's sort of like what, what I was told as a young child, as a young referee. One day I walked up on the field. Coach looked at me. He goes, man, we must have a good referee today. I said, oh, really? Why is that? Shoes are shine, socks are up, shirts tucked in. You look professional. That's a mechanical issue. Your first impression is the impression that you're going to leave those people. Okay? So if we can take care of the mechanical issues, and every year, my, you call my wife today and she'll tell you, every year, this week, because my first game's Sunday, I'll stand in front of the mirror with my flag and do this, and do this, and do this, and do that. And then I'll watch myself on TV to see if I'm here or I'm here when I'm signaling it. Or I'm here when I'm signaling it. And she used to tease me when she, we first started dating. What, do you dislike watching yourself? <laughs> now she understands because she's been around it for a while. She knows that we're very mechanically sound and we like to do that. As well as expect the unexpected. What does that really mean? Guy in the back holding in his head. What does expect the unexpected mean? What do you what do you think it means? When you know what you should do <laughs> when something might happen that shouldn't happen. Okay. Know what you should do when something might happen that you didn't think was gonna happen. Is that a good analogy of it? Anybody have something else? Other side of the room? <coughs> Young guy in the uh, black jacket sitting next to the Yeah, looking at me now. Redhead. No, I think that about covers it. Okay. So that about covers it. So expecting the unexpected, and I guess I got to get a different colored font. That's that yellow's a little hard. I apologize. Um, if, if I told you some of the things that have happened to me in matches, and then you say, "How did you handle it?" And I go, oh, "Well, after I messed on myself, then we did this, right?" You go, well, I didn't expect that. No, neither did I. But we prepare ourselves to expect those things. And we have a get out, of, get out of jail card. And we have an escape route. And we talk about those things. And the best thing to do to learn those experiences is rooms like this, where we all sit around and we talk. And if I were to tell Abigail some of the things, she'd go, no, that really didn't happen. Oh, yeah. No, that couldn't have happened. Oh, yeah. How did you get out of it? Big deep breath and ran fast. <laughs> and I always tell people, I make sure I'm not the slowest guy on the crew. <laughs> but that's, you know, learn from your mistakes. If I had a penny for every mistake I've made on the soccer field, I'd be a billionaire right now. Seriously. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've learned from a lot of mistakes. Some of them I'm still trying to learn from. Okay? But don't be so close-minded to say, all right, when you quit learning, you're done with the game. When you quit learning, you're done. Then you get, no, you can't even say that. We used to say, then you can become an assessor or an instructor, but no, you can't do that. <laughs> okay? But <clears throat> different mistakes happen. It doesn't even have to be your mistake. It can be somebody that's a friend of yours. Or somebody that you're watching the game of. And say, oh crap. 
did he really mean to do that? Did she really mean to do that? No. Oh, okay. So then you sit down and you think about it. And I always come up with three solutions. Because the first one isn't always the best. And the second one, that's the middle of the road. And the third one, that's the, you know, the last resort one. So I always come up with three options. And learn from those mistakes. And I tell you this, when it happens to you specifically, it will never happen again for a long, 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 long time. Because you'll always remember it. You know, it's that, that innate thing. Oh, crap, this happened to me. I'm not going to let it happen again. Right, wrong, or indifferent? Know your role in the team. Okay, we have all different levels of experience. And today you're the assistant referee. Assist, don't insist. Today you're the referee. And you've got young referees with you. Teach them. As a, as a FIFA referee told me in 1991, when we were sitting in a room after a bunch of matches that day, because he was at a soccer tournament, I said, why are you giving us all this information? Why are you telling us all these little things? He said, hey, this is a business. I'm giving you the tools. And if you can learn from my mistakes, it's going to make you a better referee. If I keep everything in my pocket, nobody's going to get better. You knew your role today, and you did it. 2005, I'm in France. I have a FIFA referee telling me, a FIFA assistant referee, called Out of Bounds and Offside. Yes, sir. Six minutes into the game, two-footed tackle over the top of the ball. Luckily, the guy didn't break his leg. I don't know how, but luckily he didn't. Come in the locker room after the game. The inspector says, oh, I'm going. He says, Kermit, six minutes in. Yes, sir. Two-footed tackle over the top of the ball. Yes, sir. From me to you, raise your hand so everybody can see me. Gray shirt. From me to him, why didn't you call it? Well, sir, my referee's instructions at the, at the pregame was call out of bounds and offside. Some of y'all would say, oh, you threw him under the bus, right? No, I followed the directions. I knew my role of the team. Inspector looked at him and he goes, did you really tell him that? Oh, yeah. Why would you tell him that? Well... I've never worked with him before, so I didn't know what his level of experience and expertise was. <laughs> he said, he's wearing a FIFA badge, like you. <laughs> he's from the United States. He's not from an you know, unknown country that they don't have professional soccer. I think he knows how to call that. He goes, what would you have called? I said, for me, it was a red card. He says, okay, thank you. But I knew my role that day. That's what you want. That's what you're going to get. Okay? For you guys, no. You guys have to help each other. All right? Nurture each other. Anticipate everything, but expect nothing. That's a pretty crazy in it. How can you anticipate everything, but you can't expect anything? You might have an idea on that. Joe? Prepare for the worst. Okay? Prepare for the worst. But don't assume it's going to happen. Don't assume it's going to happen. Don't prejudge. Anybody else? <coughs> Those are all good things. <coughs> Somebody said something, don't prejudge. Do we prejudge? Sometimes. Most of the time. You said this, right? Yeah. <coughs> you know? Yes. Why do you say most of the time? Because that's the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to play this game with you. You're from Central America, right? No, I'm from Mexico. You're from Central America then? No, no, no. <laughs> You're from Central America then, right? <laughs> but, watch 
Watch this. So you're Panamanian? <laughs> but you look Panamanian. So you all understand sort of where I'm going with this. I, I knew exactly when you said that. But we prejudge by what? Color of the skin, accent, right? Facial features, the uniform, gender, hair color. These are all things we have to be aware of when we talk. As well as you have to know going in when you're, when you're dealing with a team from Guatemala, okay? Playing against a team from Honduras. And you're a white guy. They're going to say to you, you're racist. How am I racist? Okay? You're a gringo. You're a gringo. <laughs> He's right. He's exactly right. It's like the day I went out and did a match. I had a team from Honduras out there. This was when I was in Jacksonville, Florida. And the assessor goes, oh, you got an international game today. Yeah. He says, you got the Hondurans versus the Rednecks. I says, huh? He goes, oh, yeah. You're going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> Three weeks later, I had them again. The Rednecks versus the Rednecks. He goes, you got another international game today. I said, no, I got two white teams playing each other. He goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> you got the Rednecks versus the rich Rednecks. So we have to be careful, but we have to anticipate things that are going to happen. You've got to have a lot of humility. Okay? The game isn't about you. You're part of the game. You're a key part of the game. 1980s, 1990s, this is your facial expression through the game. People screaming and hollering at you. Still couldn't show anything. You know you missed that call. Right? You're 100% you missed it. You realized it a minute or two later. But you would never tell a player, Oh, hey, sorry man. Bravo, sorry. I messed up. Right? What are you telling you to do nowadays? You get once or twice to do it in a game, right? Apologize that you messed it. You realize you missed it. The players are going to realize, Oh, that's, you know... He's got a little bit of humanity in him. He's able to accept his, and it's going to be better for you. So that's why humility is huge. Okay? So you have to be able to handle some of those situations, and it will help you. And constructive self-criticism. How many of you all have heard that? What does that mean? The older people in the room, tell us what constructive self-criticism means. Yes? I think that kind of goes back to, you know, you mentioned you watch yourself on tape a lot. Um, you know, you go back and ask, you know, what you could have done better, um, where can I do better? Or, you know, you take a single game approach and you're like, so I want to work on this, this game. Um, Good. Anybody else? Being in the moment, like you were saying, when, when you know you miss a call, just being able to realize, hey, I got this wrong, you know, being able to say this is what the call should have been, I want to be in game flow. Exactly. Yes, sir. Learn from what happened in the game, if you did something right, if you did something wrong, and then move on. Don't bury yourself with it. It was a game, it's over. Get it right the next time. Exactly. A lot of the constructive self criticism. And I'm glad you said, go on with it. Early in my career in MLS, if I blew a, and botched an offside decision, I would think about it for two to three to four weeks. And it would affect me. Because at that time, it was one and done. You did it right, you got a next game. You did it wrong, go back to the cow pastures. Okay? So the self-criticism and the self-analysis of the game was very, very important at that time. But what he said is true. I then got a group of people that we would talk. And it would be, they take a piece of paper and throw it in the trash and they say it's over with. Now it's time to move on. It keeps messing up your game. So I've learned to self-analyze and self-criticize and self-critique. And if it's on a Saturday... By Monday, it's done. Because I've got another game that I've got to get to. 
Okay? A lot of times it'll happen during the game. I'll know it. When you've got 20 years of experience in MLS, you sort of know when you mess up. And the coaches know that you know you messed up. There's only, ever, ever so often we don't. But that's very important. And you have to be honest with yourself when you self-criticize. And you got to enjoy the game through fair play. You're the one that creates the fair play environment. Right? The players are there. You know, I always like to say, I'd love to see how the two teams play each other if there was no referee there. I'd like to see how Club America and Chivas would play each other if there was no referee there. I'd like to see how Barcelona and Real Madrid would play each other if there was no referees there. I'd like to see how Philadelphia Union and New York Red Bulls would play each other if there was no referees there. Okay? But we have to create that. And enjoying the game is the key. In 91, I had a professional football player tell me when I was working with the Dolphins. I said, why are you still in the league? He said, I'm having fun and enjoying life. I said, okay, good. He said, the day I quit having fun and enjoying this game, I'm retiring. 92, four games into the season, I see on the ESPN ticker, he retired. I picked up the phone and called him. I said, what's up? He said, it became a job. I wasn't having any fun anymore, so I got out. He said, so... Remember, just have fun. If you're not having fun, get out. If it's too much like a job, get out of it. Okay? Because this is an enjoyment type of a job. And always come to the match prepared. For you guys, a lot of times it's just coming to the pa uh, uh, match with your, your watches, your whistles, your cards, your shirt. Okay? Well, sometimes can't prepare like we do at the professional level, at the college level, right? <laughs> I don't know now. <laughs> but at the, at the college level, you can prepare. At, you know, so we understand that. But be prepared, meaning know your laws of the game. That's the best prepare. Right? You can figure out and learn the styles of play during the match. But coming to the game prepared is the key. So how do we move towards advancement? First question is, is how important is this game to you? Treat it like every other game. When I was 17 or 18, I had a coach say to me, this is my World Cup. This is a U-12. I said, this is not your World Cup. Yeah, it is. Every Saturday we play for the World Cup. It's important to them, so it should be important to you. College coaches all the time will be telling you. College coaches all the time will be telling you. Because it matters in the conference standings. It matters in whether they get to go to the NCAAs. Okay. So how important is this game to you? Where is it going to put you to the next? If it's a Sunday morning, you're just breaking off the rust because you've been sitting in the house from October to February. Right? That's different than you're in mid-season stride. Or that's different you're at youth regionals and you're trying to go to youth nationals. Always treat the game that it's important to you and very important. What is your level of effort? Are you just out there strolling around like... Like I am right now, wandering around doing nothing? Or is your intensity matching the, te the game's intensity? Sometimes their intensity is up here and you need to bring it back down here so you're able to do that. So match their effort with your effort. Good morning. How many games in a day have you done? I've had guys say, oh, this is my sixth game. Even when I was your age, I was done after four. Mentally, I was done. Physically, I could keep going. 
But mentally, think about all the decisions you're making. And now multiply that times six. The six, the game on the six, would it really, are you giving them the best, best effort? Are you matching their level, level of effort? Okay, so think about how many games a day it is for you. What's the field conditions? What's the environment? Cow pasture or the gold put up by tailpipes? Has it rained? Is there snow? Know all of these things. Know that it's going to affect your performance as well as the player's performance on the field. Know that players love when it's rained and the field's slick. So now they can do that slide tackle into the camera from this distance. <laughs> right? And think they're going to get away with it. So you have to anticipate that, right? And start dealing with it at the beginning. Because that'll help you. Do you need this game? <clears throat> What does that mean? Do I need this game? If you're trying to go to national, if you're trying to do the national bag on it. Does the U8 game, do you need that U8 game? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Why? Experience of love. Experience of love. Okay. Do you need that sixth game of the day so you can get more experience? Or are you getting anything out of it? Yes or no? Yeah. Probably not. Because you're mentally shot. So think about that. Is it in your wheelhouse? Or is it a stretch? What does that mean? What does that mean? Right. So I put you on a U19 middle. Is that in your wheelhouse or is that a stretch? Why? Because I'm not... Oh, you're not good enough to ref that yet. That's good. What's in your wheelhouse? I can't keep up with them. You can't keep up with them? Which, which age? Oh, the U19 game. Oh, the U19 <laughs> game. Okay, so what I'm going to tell you is every fifth game, make it a stretch if you're trying to get to the next level. Every fifth, fifth game, make it a stretch. Make it something that's going to work you a little bit harder. Get out of your comfort zone. Then after you've done that for a year, every other game, or every third game, or every fourth game, work on getting it to win all these games. Are not a quote stretch. Okay? And you're more comfortable because it's going to break that comfort zone. Match fitness. That's mental and physical. Mentally, your body's going to tell you you're tired. And you're going to start making mistakes before physically you'll make. Okay? So you have to work games to get yourself mentally fit to do that. Physical part we can do in the gym, we can do on the track, we can do it on the field. The mental part is watching, going, going, making decisions, making decisions, making decisions. A lot of us, when we're not watch, working the game, we're watching the game, and some guys, and there's one of them in the room, we try to make the offside decision or the foul decision before the referee blows the whistle on the game. That's how we mentally, some, some of the ways we mentally. Okay? Professionalism. Come prepared. A lot of you all, and now I'm going to go to the youth tournaments, I'm going to go to the NCAA tournaments, y'all come to the, those events, not knowing rules of competition, not knowing, okay, <clears throat> subs, know those things going in. Heck, it's easier now knowing about them 
than it was 20 years ago. Now all you need is this thing. Let me borrow this for a second. Now all you need is this thing. You can get anything you want. They send them out to you online. 20 years ago, you'd come walking into one of these meetings and the book is sick. Then you go, oh wait, we're with this still like Oh, okay, great. Region 2, let me go to the US YSA. Okay, but you've got to come prepared. And that's part of professionalism. Knowing what's going to happen. Prepare for the meetings, and then when you get on the field, it's even easier. Diet. A lot of you all trying to get to the next level, you're eating unhealthy. Okay? Gone are the days that we have to worry about that. And your personality needs to be neutral. Your body language, we spoke about that. So we want to manage our stress during that matches. Using the wrong personality with the wrong team. We spoke about that a little while ago. All right? You can't always be a dictator. Sometimes you've got to be smooth and compassionate. Not working as a team. You've got to work. Get the serious challenges and deal with the challenges right the first time. We've seen tackles that come in and get this. <coughs> So think. You can get rid of game flow for game control. Y'all hear game flow, game control? Well, if you can't control the game, forget the flow. Right? Because it's not going to be flowing. You're going to be dealing more with misconduct than anything else. What do you do if there's a lot of misconduct? Like throughout the game? Well, you stop the game? No, I mean, just, as, as we say, if they haven't been smart enough to figure it out, you can just keep doing it. Keep issuing the caution. Cautions don't work out, then you go to race cards. Then you send them home. Okay? Transition running. Gone are the days where, you know, we're on a nice, slow jog. There's a lot more explosive speed, sprint, speed, sprint, counterattack, counterattack, counterattack. So you need to work on transition running and how you look. And report writing. Gosh, we hear that from the top level down. We have to do better. And what I always say is, guys, make it easy. Open up the law book. Write verbatim what the law says. You caution for this, you caution for that, you sent off for this, you sent off for that, and then be done. Just give me the facts. I don't need anything else. All right? And get a solid pregame. Solid pregame helps everything. Assistant referees. Here's the takeaways. We're trying to call fouls in the red zone. What's the red zone? Anybody know what the red zone is? It's the point, the the goal. The penalty box. Here, I'll show you. There's the red zone. As an AR, right? As an AR. Trying to juggle priorities. We're not focusing on the second and last defender. We're watching the ball and the second and last defender is over here. Okay? Matching referee's personality. He's a hard hit, right? You're soft. <coughs> You're a hard hit, he's a soft hit. You, you gotta. When you're dealing with the players, you've got to sort of mix that together. The good cop, bad cop doesn't always work. All right. Everybody has to be the good cop. Running styles. Some of you all run all over the place. 
arms flailing, flag moving. Okay. That's what we have to be aware of. <clears throat> so, anything in the green zone? That the referee's been calling it? You call it. You have the ability to do that. Anything in the yellow zone? Use caution. Look where the assistant, <coughs> where the referee is, and no. And anything in the red zone, you better be a thousand percent sure <laughs> in your decision before you raise that flag. Okay. Game demand. Game demand. All right. Government. Yes. Can you give an example in your own games where you had to step in with the red zone? Yeah, 2004 MLS Cup final. Handball right here on the goal line off of a corner kick. The referee doesn't see it. <clears throat> okay. Have you ever made a call when you're in a trail? So the red zone way up there? Yeah. <coughs> one, maybe. maybe once, maybe twice. But I didn't raise the flag. That's it. I did it over the headset. Yep. Sir? Is that, red zone, is that like not on your side of the field? I'm AR1 here. Okay. Or AR2. This is the AR. Oh, okay. And this is the referees. Oh, okay. Any questions? <coughs> yes, sir. Did he call the penalty? Did I call the penalty? Yes. yes. I called did he call? He, he followed my, my signal, and then we had to send him off. And this is where changing pregames, and our pregame is, is very important because his was, if you raise the flag, make sure you're 100% sure. And then he gave a different mechanic, and I, it was one that I just heard, so now I'm mentally going raise the flag, wiggle it, and then, you know, so it gave me time, and it gave him time to now see what was going on. So, yes, sir. Didn't you ask yourself, is the one who's making more money than me? No, I didn't ask myself at that point in time. <laughs> Only because that guy I know, with, he, you know Michael Kennedy, you know he would go with whatever you make that decision of. So I, I, it was the game. I had to make sure that the game was where it needed to be. Any other questions over anything we've covered today? Come on, y'all got to have one or two. Yes? So the red zone, like, is that a left or a right? It's a left. How do you, AR1 is here. AR2 is there. So anything that happens here, the referee would be in this area. Okay, and it would be flipped if it was. Because as I ref, like I run all over the field because I don't know what a left or right is. Okay. So the easiest way to understand is a left is you're with the left winger, and uh, the assistant referee is on your right. Well, Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> who, who was your instructor? <laughs> her instructor did tell her that. Thank you very much. Both sides, Jill. Both y'all. There it is. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, you've been very fortunate. There's two other guys that are from Region 2. The uh, decided to come in. This is George Gantner, retired FIFA assistant referee. Um, I can't go through all of his accolades. We don't have enough time. This is Ricardo Salazar, Salazar he retired uh, FIFA, FIFA referee. He was in France with me in 2000. Correction, I'm not retired. I, I was not nominated. <laughs> no, 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 okay. no. Active, active MLS referee. So. And George is our, one of our five um, assistant referee coaches. PRO has decided to give us coaches to help us get better. So he's and I'm younger than he is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's and I was not the referee in 2004.